Hi, my name is Dane Duval. I'm a certified Alzheimer's educator and I'm presenting today effective communication strategies and dementia care. And I've developed this for our professional care partners. This presentation is supported by a grant from HRSA, which is the Health Resources and Services Administration, which is part of the federal government's Health and Human Services. I am the Alzheimer's Disease and Related Dementias Curriculum Coordinator at the College of Osteopathic Medicine at Nova Southeastern University. I'm also a nationally certified Alzheimer educator, and I'm Florida certified dementia training provider. So we're going to discuss different aspects of communication. I find that communicating with people living with Alzheimer's disease is a difficult proposition a lot of times because their mind doesn't enable them to speak to us and communicate to us in the way that we would normally work with, with people. And also they have a, a difficulty in understanding what we're talking about. So as I say here that um, communication with a person with ADRD, which is the uh, initials for Alzheimer's disease and related disorders or dementia, requires us to have patience. It happens that we need to really understand and that's not always easy for us. And also we have to have li good listening schools and also good interpersonal skills. So we have to understand that communication is one of the first areas that is affected by the disease. And it's not only speaking. Remember that communication is a two-way street. We speak and we hear, which we should also listen, but we also try to comprehend what someone is saying. And when the brain is dying, and yes, the brain is dying, this is a terminal disease that over time, all functions of the body, which are controlled by the brain, stop functioning. So a lot of times we have this word salad. People have a, a difficult time finding words or locating words. And a lot of times they create phrases to describe a word. And so this really becomes problematic because often she has a hard time following a conversation. And it's many times because she can't recall what was previously just said, not even two minutes ago. And you'll notice that I use the word she and her. We find that more people that are affected by this disease are women. We're not sure exactly why, it could be genetics. I believe that it's because women live longer than men. And what is the number one risk factor for getting Alzheimer's disease? It's age. I want you to think about this. A lot of times we, we use the word behaviors in air quotes. And what we're saying is that someone might have a behavioral disorder. They might be a problem for us because of their behaviors. Let's think of this differently. This person is dying, their brain is dying, and they are living in distress. We need to realize that their distress creates communication problems. And we're gonna to have to deal with that and care for them accordingly. These are your helping hands. We know that you need as much as you can in the way of education as part of the tools that you use. And so that's what we're gonna go over today is, is that the tools that you need to work with communication. And here are the strategies in communicating with people. And these are the five areas we'll cover over the next few minutes. Orientation, validation, redirection, simple sentences and questions, and memory cueing. And I know that you guys know a lot about this, but I'm sure there'll be a few things that you can pick up today. So we really appreciate your attention and your attendance today. So the orientation, that's really about how you orient yourself and present yourself to your resident, your client, your patient. First of all, you must identify yourself. I don't care if you've just seen your resident 10 minutes ago. If you go back into the room, always re-identify yourself. Number one, if they're confused, this helps them to put a familiar face and, and to let them know that they're in a safe place. 
always approach the person quietly and slowly and always from the front. Um, by explaining, and, and since you can't see me in person, I want you to understand that people at the moderate stage of dementia, and that's usually who you're providing care for, they no longer have peripheral vision. So if you approach them from the slide, they might react and, and jerk, and they might actually slap you because they don't know that you're standing there. Um, once you're in front of them and on their level, approach them at eye level. So if they're standing up, you can be standing up. If they're sitting down, then you need to kneel down and approach them from the front and keep eye contact. Keep looking at them in the eyes is a form of communication. Um, call the person by name. This helps you get their attention. Now, I'll tell you a, a story that some uh, CNAs told me. There was this gentleman who came into a memory care community and he was very active. Um, he was not, um, he probably wasn't even at the moderate stage of dementia, but his wife had previously died and there was no one to take care of him and he no longer could drive. And so when he came into the community, of course, there's the intake form and you get as much information as possible. So this gentleman seemed to be very friendly. However, they noticed that when they would, they would come in and call him Robert, he would get upset. And us trying to find out why he gets upset is one of those communication strategies that we're talking about. We're talking about calling the person by their name. They call him Robert. Calling him Robert seemed to upset him. So over and over, they were taking note that Robert was upset when you entered the room and called him Robert. Come to find out, Robert had been a judge for many years and no one had ever called him Robert. Even his wife called him Bobby. So people calling him Robert was a sign of disrespect. They finally figured out that because of this situation, he felt disrespected. He felt that they should be calling him your honor or judge. So one of those little things, that's, that's where we have to be detectives in this work. And then we found out that that upset him because we weren't calling him by the name. So ask the person what name they would like to be called. For instance, my first name is Timothy. And if you called me Timothy, I would think I'm in trouble because only my mom calls me Timothy. So my middle name is Dane and I've gone by that most of my life. So even though my intake form and my legal documents say, Timothy, if you call me Timothy, I'm not going to pay attention to you. So little things like this will help you with your residents, clients, or patients. Speak slowly. Um, at some point, we understand that only about 25% of the words are understood by people at the moderate to advanced stages of dementia. So speaking slowly can help people in an earlier state of uh, decline. And also we have people that have hearing problems and they're not always um, fixed by using hearing aids or maybe the hearing aids are, aren't working properly. So this whole orientation part of it is figuring out how best to address and communicate with your resident. Validation, there's a whole theory of validation and validation theory actually, and it's something that people use that on a much higher level of uh, training and, and academia. Basically, what we need to do is make sure that we are approaching someone in the space that they're in. Whatever their reality is, that's where we need to be with them. Keep in mind that reality is gonna change several times during the course of the day. It could change several times during the course of a conversation. Figure out when you're dealing with someone where they are, where in their mind, what locality they are. So if you were, let's say we're in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, and the person that I'm providing care for says, oh my goodness, why is it such a hot day? It's the middle of winter. And then you're saying, okay, we're, we don't have winter. So what you need to do is figure out where she thinks she is. She grew up in upper state Michigan. Summer doesn't happen for very, very long, uh, the upper peninsula, I know for a fact. When it is, it's beautiful. 
But if she's trying to, if she find out where she thinks she is and move into that place, always move into her reality. Don't try to convince her that what she believes isn't true because guess what? That is not going to happen. If she's looking outside and said, oh my goodness, that's the most beautiful chartreuse sky. First of all, figure out what chartreuse is. It's a color that signifies like a bright green. And if she thinks that the sky is green, don't tell her that the sky is blue or pink. Say, oh my goodness, tell me about the skies where you grew up. See, now you're, you're, you're going into try to figure out a happy place or figure out what she's talking about. Maybe she's experienced a chartreuse sky, maybe something that she read in a book or saw in a movie. Ask these questions because what really helps is we want to get as much information about the people that we care for because by doing that, we're able to provide better care. We're able to um, alleviate some problems because we know more about them and about the happy times that they live through. The, the, the thing about her surroundings and where she is right now, as long as she's not in that distress mode, file that away. Um, first of all, that, that she feels safe and secure wherever she is when she's talking about the, the space that she's happy about. Um, these are not lies. Don't, don't feel guilty about it, but always keep in mind that you want to be in her reality and move within her reality as she does. So in this re redirection portion of this, again, go back to don't try to contradict them. A person who is, has a brain that is slowly dying from Alzheimer's disease or another dementia, you're never gonna win the argument. Try creative ways to redirect the conversation. If she seems to be getting more distressed or agitated, um, angry, remember these m memories that, that she shared with you, things that she does remember, maybe from her childhood, maybe from a very nice place in her life when she was really happy. Bring those happy memories up. That's why you need to ask these questions and file them away. You'll remember when talking with people, and I know that you'll be, you're, you take care of many people, but you know each of them better than anyone else does in the organization. Remember that her short-term memory is impaired, so changing the subject is not being rude, but, but you're, quote-unquote, redirecting her. Changing that subject, and, and even if it's not, you don't have the ability to change the subject gently, sometimes you just might have to abruptly change the, the topic because she, you see that she's getting uh, upset. Um, and as people get more agitated and angry, maybe you have to literally redirect her to a calm and quiet place. We know that noises and a lot, lots of activities can upset people when they're having a bit of distress. So find a quiet room, find a place that, that she, you know she's always happy, but it, take her from that place where she's getting agitated immediately and get her to that quiet place where you can actually help calm her down. So the simple sentences and questions, that is something like, for instance, when it's time for breakfast, and when I do this in person, I, I ask uh, one of the members, I said, okay, so for breakfast this morning, would you like eggs and bacon, pancakes and sausage, granola with some yogurt, or would you just like black coffee and tea, and then I can get you some cookies? What would your answer be? It's going to be cookies, because that's the last thing I said. So don't give people lots of choices. Make it very simple. When it comes time for, for food, would you like bacon or would you like eggs? Those are two simple things. Now you can say, she might say, I want both. But if you add three and four or five questions and selections, she's going to very, get very confused. So make it very simple. Don't ask a lot of questions at once. That's not helping you. It's not helping her. She, her mind, remember, it's slowly dying. There's parts of her brain that we call reason. They cannot reason away how to answer all of these questions. Also, the, the, this decision-making, the, they, they can't. Remember, the brain is scrambled. 
it misfires, it miscommunicates. And so if you are asking them to make a very difficult answer, and they've got to go through a lot of steps to get to your answer, that's only going to confuse them and irritate them and cause agitation and anger. So remember, we have collected different memories from them. But, but additionally, what we can do is use words or things that's um, laying around. You can gesture to things. As, if they're getting confused and, and you know they're trying to communicate with you, then it's a lot easier for you to point to something. We want to give them as much independence as possible. So let them try to get out what they're trying to say to you. When it comes down time for maybe it's in home health or maybe it's even around their, their room and assisted living, you can put reminder notes on things or color code things or number things uh, to help them. And that's only going to work at, to a certain point in the disease. We also want them to lay, to, to be able to get dressed on their own. So, you know, my dad um, died from Alzheimer's about 10 years ago. And so there were times that he would come in, out of his room. My mom would tell me the story that, that he would be dressed except for his underwear was on the outside of his pants. And to him, that made perfect sense. So if you need to, we can lay things out piece by piece. And then you can maybe just point to something. You want her to do as much as possible on her own. And once she begins the task, then if she is getting frustrated, then by all means, help her with that task because we don't want her to get to the point where things irritate her, agitate her, make her angry, get her disgusted. So tell me what this guy is trying to communicate to you. What is he telling you? He's using nonverbal communications to tell you something. It's up to us to figure out what he's trying to say. So these are, in, in many cases, when people can no, can no longer communicate with us, then it's going to be a problem for us to understand what they're trying to say. But we are really good at, at understanding nonverbal communication. The way someone looks at you, the way their head is nodding. They don't, and, and you'll know nodding up and down doesn't always mean yes, does it? The body positioning, how are they slumped in the chair? Is that just because they're asleep? Or also their, their posture gives us an idea. Maybe they're showing us the, the differing positions because they're in pain. They can gesture things. There are certain gestures, you know, somebody puts up their middle finger, you know exactly what they're trying to tell you, but they haven't said a word. Or maybe they have, but you, you get the point. Facial expressions are something that we can learn to be those detectives and understand things. Even breathing. If you have people that do not have COPD or any other uh, pulmonary issues or breathing issues, then all of a sudden you're understanding that they're breathing deeply. <sighs> And you know that they're fine, but that could mean, and there's quite a bit of study going on about breathing in people that are non-communicative, we can understand that that's pain. Now it's up to us because they are not able to tell you where the pain is, but that will tell you that there is something going on and we need to, to understand what that is. Um, all of these things, we can start to learn how to communicate and understand what the person that we're caring for is communicating with us. So some of these ideas that, that could help to limit the communications are things that, that we sometimes may not think of, but it's things that we actually know intuitively. So again, it's back to your, the very first thing is face the person, be at their eye level. Um, use simple gestures, don't use big, um, things that they can't understand. Listen with your eyes. You can learn a lot about what someone's trying to tell you with just watching them. If she's using a nonverbal cue, show that you understand. Say yes. Oh, that's right. I understand. You want to go to the bathroom. Or, oh, you're hungry. Well, let's go see if we can find a snack for you. Lunch will be served shortly, but I, if you're hungry, let's go get something for you. 
if you don't understand what she's trying to do, don't show your frustration. Remember that this is, communication is a two-way street. It's something that we all show. We don't just always say what we mean. Additionally, our body language tells us things. If you come in and you've had a, a bad morning, you've been rushed to work, the kids couldn't get off to school in time, you're, this is the third day you're, this week that you're late and you know you're gonna be in trouble, and then you come in and you didn't bother to check all those emotions at the door and you start with your residence and you come in with your hand on your hip and you go, hmm, and you're showing a disgust in your face and you're, you're showing physical outward manifestations of anger and disgust, guess what? Your resident's gonna pick up on that. And if you think you're having a bad day now, just wait until this person starts throwing you distress signals because you have ruined their day because they were in a good mood until you got in and with your hand on your hip and looking at them like, Missy, I'm gonna take care of you today. So, Again, the breathing is important. You are able to predict some emotional responses with that breathing. And we know that touch is something that's hugely important. Remember back to that picture, a simple hand on someone's hand to say, I may not understand what you're going through. I know it's rough, but I'm here to help. And just look for permission to touch. You know the people that you can touch, the other people you know, are, will never allow you to touch them even on the shoulder, just slightly on the hand. But that will help soothe. And by all means, remain calm. You have to remain calm because if you show the agitation, then she's going to mirror your emotions. Remember that the person, it's, it's just going to be like a snowball rolling downhill. If you become negative, and even the slightest nonverbal cues from your part, then she's gonna become frustrated and she is going to make your day a living hell just because you started the day off wrong. So we know what these types of nonverbal communications are. They're eye contact, touch, body language, and vocal sounds without words. I'm sure that you're taking care of people or have taken care of people who no longer can form words, but their grunts, their growls, their hmms, their ugh, their ah, all of these non-verbal sounds are something that over time you get to understand because you are the detective in providing this care. So here's a happy family. How many of you have happy families of your residents? I know that this can sometimes be a topic that's very difficult to deal with because all of the good work that you do can easily be undone by a family member who doesn't understand what you go through on a day-to-day -day basis. Maybe they come in once a week. Maybe they live out of town and they only see their parent once a year. But let's keep this in mind. We have ways of talking and communicating with families. So what we have to do is when you've got a family member who seems to be upset with the way you're providing care, what we need to do is come up with a different way for them to view the situation. Um, what we need to do is make sure that they understand what this disease is about and what to expect provide resources for them. And we have resources the, at the end of this presentation that I want all of you to take notes on because this is something that you can provide to family members. This is something that, that people are not able to deal with. I know when my father first started showing signs of dementia, it was very difficult on us because we didn't know, we didn't know anything about it. How do you deal with it? Most families don't. We have better education now than what we did 25 years ago when this happened to my family. But what we need to do is make sure that whether through your organization or outside organizations, um, you provide education and support, including support groups. Um, 
it's very important that you understand this family dynamic. You might have a, uh, the daughter who is there every day, takes care of mom along with you. Um, she's there, she understands, she sees the hard work that you provide. And then you might have uh, a son who lives in New York and he pays the bills. And he feels like he has the right to know things at the drop of a hat. He'll make phone calls. He'll come in unannounced and, and demand that, that you change up the care plan because he's the one who's paying for it. These are the family dynamics. You all might also have uh, someone who is part of that family. So you've got the, the one daughter who's taking care of mom every day and comes and visits. You've got a son who is bitchy to you. Uh, and then you've got the third person who just stands by and lets the other two um, provide the care and you might not have any interaction, but that is the family unit. I want you to remember that that is a family. That is their family. Understand what the family dynamic is, but never insert yourself into the middle of it. I'm sure this has happened to you where you got dragged into it. You're not part of that family. You're not going to completely understand what they're going through. Myself, as a family member who went through this, I don't understand what other family members are going through. If it seems to be that it's unbearable, make sure that you bring in your supervisor. You are not equipped to deal with this. Make sure that there is either a social worker on staff that you can go to, but don't get dragged into the drama that's going on. And if you need someone to step in, I'm sure that your organization has given you um, the hierarchy of, of who to get help from. But at some point, maybe this family needs social worker or other types of professional help to work through their problems of understanding what this disease is and what to expect going down the road. So we have cultural differences, all of us. We, we don't look alike, we don't worship alike, some people don't even worship at all. Some people uh, believe in certain things. Some people believe, don't believe in some things. Uh, we all come from different backgrounds, as does our resident. I want you to try to understand the diversity of a person and, and her family. Um, you know, if you find out a little bit about her culture and, and understand where she might be coming from and then also where the family comes from, if there's a language barrier, try to learn a few phrases so that you can communicate better with them. That it goes a long way. Also, too, a lot of times in this disease, people revert, they might be bilingual, um, but sometimes they revert back to their mother tongue and that they no longer understand their second language. Um, see what the person's views and the family view on healthcare, because it's a lot different in a lot of countries and where some people just won't receive help um, or outside help. Some people feel that it's the family's responsibility and therefore they don't provide any outside help. Now that can create a problem for you who are providing the outside help when the family uh, gets involved. Don't assume anything about anyone. Figure out what you need to know, ask questions. Remember that People's memories of, of childhood and growing up and long-term memory, that stays with them for a long time. I want you to realize here that we have to make sure that we understand that diversity also applies to sexual orientation and gender identification. Regardless of what your thoughts are, people are people and their belief system and how they present themselves Regardless of what your personal beliefs are, check that at the door. If someone presents as gay or lesbian or transgender, respect that and make sure that you make them feel safe. We have enough bullying in senior living and we want to alleviate that, especially when it comes to sexual orientation and gender identification. But always above everything, just be respectful of the person. They are there to be cared for by you regardless of their skin color, who they love, where they come from, what they believe, what they don't believe. 
It's your job to take care of that person. Also, there's a lot of barriers to different cultures and they may not have ever been able to get good health care or social services. Try to provide uh, that care as much as possible if you have people that either you speak their language or find someone who does or at least get some translation services and try to provide as many care and services in that person's uh, native language. There's all kinds of things that you can learn from here, but I think that you can actually cultivate a good relationship with the families over time by understanding what their belief system is and understand maybe where they come from. And, and, and your resident or your client or your patient will be very good at giving you background. And then that, those are points that you can make with the family. It's, there's a whole lot of things here that we need to go through and it can be how they view end of life and how their faith is and what all kinds of different I want to say belief system, but it could just be the way that they were brought up. Or maybe the parent was brought up one way and the children were brought up another way. Get to know those kind of things because as much as you can know about the family and the interaction, it's going to make you provide better care for not only the resident, but also in communicating with the family member. The family member needs to be given as much education and support as you can. And I'm sure that your organization provides you resources, but like I said, we have more coming at the end of the presentation. So, you know, there's, there's a keep calm and fill in the blank for everything. But I just want you to, to know that you can keep calm and carry on. There are things that, that if you need, if, if you're getting upset during the course of the day, remember if, if you have your hand on your hip and you're thinking, okay, Missy, what are you going to give me today? And have that attitude. Maybe just leave the room for a minute, take a deep breath, come back in, regroup. So remember, this is distress. The, we have to understand what these behaviors, the distress, and figure out how we can work through that. Someone who is presenting as a behavioral problem, they're really someone who's trying to tell you something. Figure out what they're trying to tell you, keep notes. I always tell the CNAs in assisted living and memory care and nursing homes, keep a little notepad for each person because you can see what, when the distress comes up, you can keep notes what, what not to do or what to do. I'll tell you a quick story. Um, one of the CNAs that I've worked with, she told me that she had to call off one time and she had, to, she had a favorite resident. And of course, we're not supposed to have favorite residents, but we always, we always do. Someone that just gets right to your heart. And she felt really bad because one day she didn't leave specific instructions. She, she knew that someone else would be taking care of her during the day. So she, was, um, she had to take a day off. She was doing something with her kids at, at uh, a school field trip or something like that. And so she got this 911 text saying, Mrs. McGillicuddy is awful today. We don't know what to do. She keeps asking for you. She keeps saying, Pam knows what to do. Pam knows what to do. And I'm not doing that today. And so she, she's trying to, Pam is trying to figure out, okay, what is going on? Okay, it's Friday. Friday is the day. Well, she, just tell her that, that she's going to the, to the beauty parlor today. She's going to get her hair done. Oh, we already know that. And that's why she's not getting dressed. What do you mean she's not getting dressed? Well, she refuses to get dressed. She will not get out of her bed. She is so upset and we can't do anything with her. She keeps asking for you. She goes, Pam knows what to do. Pam knows what to do. So we had to, we, had, we, we need your help. We need your help. Well, did you lay out her clothes? Well, yes, we laid out her clothes. Well, what did you lay out? Well, we put out um, a red top and a black pair of slacks. Oh no, Pam said. I forgot to leave you the most important thing. I always lay out her pink velour running suit with the little sparkles down the legs, those little diamonds. 
that's what she wears to go to the beauty parlor every Friday. And it was my fault for not telling you. So they got the pink running suit out and Mrs. McGillicuddy came to life. I, she said, see, I told you Pam would know. So this is a distress. This was a huge behavior problem because Miss McGillicuddy was in distress. Pam knew the routine. Mrs. McGillicuddy knew the routine, but it had not been communicated with the staff. So this whole day went to hell in a handbasket all for the simple fact that an outfit was not put out. But it, recall, it, it brought out these behavioral problems because Mrs. McGillicuddy was in distress and they couldn't figure it out. But Pam did. Pam figured it out. Again, you guys are the detectives in this work. And so we know that over time, many people lose their filters. We call this <laughs> problem big time. People that are, have never created problems are now your biggest problem makers. And don't even bother to tell the family because, oh no, my mom would never curse. My mom would never spit. She would never act up. She's the sweetest little old lady. In fact, she used to teach Sunday school. There's no way she would say those bad words. Well, guess what? The brain is dying, I can't stress that enough, and things change. The brain dies, the brain changes. Things that normally people would be able to hold back and use their filters are no longer ever, they can't do that anymore. Um, a woman that I know, she told me that um, she would love to, she, her father was living with her before um, finally going into uh, memory care. And, whenever they would go out, her father, he loved to go to the mall and just walk around and window shop and then they would have lunch. And so when they were walking down the mall, her dad would yell out, did you see that big fat pig? Why is she out in public? She's too fat to be in public. This lady was mortified. And of course the person walking by was just irate. Or he would go by somebody and say, did you see the knockers on that one? And of course, again, the lady was mortified. They would be sitting down at, at lunch and, and the, the waiter would bring something over and, and would not deliver it the right way. And he would say, who taught you how to serve food? Who, wh why don't you go back to school and learn? My friend did not want to quit being able to take her father out in public, but it was become, becoming more and more problematic. She came up with a really great solution. She had t-shirts made up and she, it said on there, please excuse my dad, he has Alzheimer's. And so once people saw that t-shirt, they kind of grinned and, and regarded him and gave him a nice greeting. And then when he would say, call somebody a fat pig, they would just laugh it off. Or any of those things that he would do, they would just, they, they realized that it wasn't his fault you have to remember that the person, we can't blame the person, and I know you've heard this before, you can't blame the person, you have to blame the disease. So the strategies that we have in, in, in this communication world, keep it very personal. We believe in person-centered care, so you cannot communicate and, and try to figure out all of this care by treating everybody the same. No two people are the same, no two people with dementia are the same. No cases of, of dementia are the same. So there's, there's many things that you have to do person by person. Also, look at the positive things. What can people still do? Don't say, oh, they can no longer do something. Let's say, oh, they're really good at painting pictures. They're really good at singing songs. They're really good at making vases out of Play-Doh. Whatever that they can keep doing, let's have them do that. Let's, let's, let's build up the good things that they can still do. And you're gonna realize some of the things that they can no longer do and help them with that. Or if you see that it upsets them, then don't, don't make them go back and don't make them go to 
to coloring book class if they just don't like it. There are plenty of things that you can be creative about. And I know that your activities people know this, but if you see that they're not enjoying something, by all means, don't make them keep doing it. Help them by doing the things that they can do and everyone's life is gonna be much better. So when you see that someone gets agitated or they get aggressive, figure out what the triggers are. Back to your little notebook, when Mrs. Smith sees Mr. Jones, she gets upset. Now, obviously you can't always keep her from seeing Mr. Jones, but maybe it's in a certain place. Maybe it's where, maybe he's sitting in a place that she likes to sit. Remember, you've got to figure these things out as the detective. So all of these triggers, it could be something that is, they're uncomfortable. Guess what? Maybe their shoes no longer fit. Maybe they're dentures. That happens all the time. They get one set of dentures and maybe over time their mouth has changed. Maybe their dentures are giving them mouth sores. Maybe their hearing aids aren't tuned properly. Maybe they're too loud or maybe they're too low. There's certain things that we can check. Again, I can't stress this enough. You are detectives. Figure it out because they can't tell you. A lot of times, and especially like with my father, I saw, again, I wanted to get keep him in the public as much as possible. I would take him for breakfast. I would take him for lunch. We would go to the mall. We would go to different places that he really liked. Um, I remember when I realized that I could no longer take him into places because it was just too much for him. One, I remember we were at Cracker Barrel and everything was being finished and the person was cleaning the plates off and it was making lots of noise and my dad kept, I could see the distress on his face and I could see that he was just no longer able to deal with all that noise. And so I know that that was a problem with him. And so I knew that hmm, this isn't a good idea for, for bringing him back to this restaurant because it was too much noise. Additionally, the, the, one of the last times I realized I could no longer take him in public, we were at um, SeaWorld and we'd gone from seeing Shamu and I, we just had to leave early because I knew it would be crowded when they were leaving. We went to the next area and people started just running past my dad to get to the next place. And my dad just crouched down with his hands over his ears and I could just tell that that was just too much. It was too much overstimulation. He could no longer be in that type of environment. So look at those kind of things. Um, sometimes those triggers are their inability to, to communicate with you and you see that they get agitated. Um, a lot of times too, one of the triggers could be that it's a different care partner. Maybe someone um, no longer works in your organization and now a new person has been assigned during the daytime. And, when, and the daytime seems to be um, the most problematic when we change care providers. Um, and so that could be, it could also be, um, one of the a big trigger that I see is that, that people are no longer able to filter out extraneous noises. And so sometimes the TV is too loud or the radio is too loud or there's problems at the dining area and there's just too much overstimulation. But the, one of the biggest times that I see is shift change. Um, you see people got, getting their belongings and leaving. You see new people coming in. It's a lot of, especially the, the shift from morning to evening. That's really a big problem because first of all, people are leaving. Your residents want to leave with them. But then there's this communication. It's all this activity. So at that time, we have to be really careful because that's when the agitation and aggression. And then there's also the part of sundowning where we understand that that, that can affect their behavior. My suggestion is when you see this sundowning time, let them take a nap. They are exhausted. Their brain is just trying to get them through the day. So instead of giving them extra activities, maybe just let them rest. I know that, that a lot of times we want to give them activities during this quote unquote sundowning time. My advice is follow them, follow their lead. If they're exhausted, let them rest in their room for a while instead of trying to keep them active. Um, once you understand what these triggers are, then what you need to do is take the right actions. 
make sure that everybody is safe and calm. Don't try to, if someone's being aggressive, be very careful how you approach them. You can't get upset. Remember, if you're showing outward signs of anxiety or anger, they're going to pick up on that. Obviously, whatever is going on, if that's not working, then stop whatever intervention you're trying to do, whether it's distracting them, whether it's redirecting them, whether it's getting to a quiet place or whether it's playing music, whatever it is, if that's not working, stop what you're doing and try to calm the situation a different place, a different way. And if need be, you might need to find a supervisor to assist in, in that type of moment. You guys are a great team. This is your teamwork. And it takes more than one person to care for someone. It takes, a, it takes more than a team. So what I want to just go over towards the end of this is just in summary, you've got to be patient. You have to be patient with the person, your, your resident, your client, your patient, or the, the, the person that you're caring for. Um, be patient with their family. I know that's not easy sometimes. Like I said before, a lot of times all the good work that you do gets undone when the family comes to visit. But really be patient with yourself because you're never going to do everything right. It is going to be one of those things where, oh, I really screwed up. Forgive yourself. Move on. Learn from it. <laughs> Just keep on going. Um, be supportive. Be supportive of the person. Help them do the things they can do and then help them uh, understand. And, and don't, don't try to force them to do something that they're not able of doing. Um, Show them that you understand, be kind, don't argue, be respectful. Remember the nonverbal communication, helping them. You can use nonverbal so that they understand because if they're not understanding you, um, there goes that distress again. Um, so whatever you can do to help in a nonverbal way, remember that touch goes a long way. Whenever there's a problem, let's find a quiet environment. That way that person can calm down. If it, if it needs to be um, that she's escalating to a point where you know it's going to get really bad, let's help her find something that doesn't create the distraction to her being calm, but maybe you are creating a distraction by providing that calm spot. She is going to be uh, frustrated with not being able to communicate to you or understand you, um, show her in a way that she understands that you're, that you're there to help and that you, while you may not understand fully what's going on, you're there to help her get through that moment. Sometimes the mo emotions just aren't what they seem to be. Try to understand the feelings that are trying to be conveyed and try, again, remember, don't you get frustrated because it's only going to, to create more problems. I really like this because I know that you guys are not in this alone. We're all here to help support you and to, to give you guidance on, on things. And so that's why I wanted to provide these resources. Take out your phones and take uh, uh, screenshots of this. This is uh, really great information for um, all kinds of information for um, Alzheimer's disease uh, from the National Institute of Aging, from the federal government, from the Alzheimer's Association. I'm sure that you guys are familiar with them. There's also the Alzheimer's Foundation of America. They have great training programs and, and resources. Um, the, You'll notice that in all caps, a deer, that's something that's really good that the government provides for um, education and referrals. Um, a Place for Mom has some really good resources. If you look at that specific um, website, you'll see a lot of really good things for yourself and also for family members. Hope you guys can uh, go to some of these resources. And here's some really great training resources. Um, again, from the Alzheimer's Association, Alzheimer's Foundation of America from the CARES program. It's a really great program. Um, maybe even let your uh, 
the supervisors know this or uh, you administrators who are watching today, CARES is something that I really like because it uses real caregivers uh, and people living with dementia and it's a, they show a lot of videos and it's really, really very good. Um, and it's not role play, it's actual people doing um, the work. Um, and there's a whole bunch of listed listing here. Obviously, um, Nova Southeastern University has uh, quite a few uh, resources for you. Um, I'll give you my contact information. So if anything here, or if you want a copy of this presentation, I'm glad to send it to you. Um, here are some information in Espanol. Um, so these are four things that are really good for family members, for care providers, um, the 10 warning signs of Alzheimer's and dementia, um, and also uh, some ideas for, for self-help as well and, and self-care. So uh, we've come to the end of this presentation and I really need your help in this. Um, if you will go to this, if you have a uh, phone that can do a QR code and scan that, it'll take you right to the survey. I really need everybody who watches this and listens to this to do the survey. Um, the survey, you can see the link here. And if you're watching it um, online uh, and you have access and you're actually watching this, you can actually tap on um, the resources here. Um, the presentation title, if you'll put that in there, is Effective Communication Strategies in Dementia Care. And there are six simple questions, very easy. Um, it really helps us. The federal government wants us to show that uh, how many people have, have attended these webinars. And if you're interested in me providing this as a live webinar, then please get into contact with me and I can do this for uh, live where we can do question and answers uh, with your organization. So again, here's the, the link to the survey. And here's my information. Again, my name is Dane Duval, and I'm, a, I'm the ADRD Curri Curriculum Coordinator at the Kieran C. Patel College of Osteopathic Medicine at Nova Southeastern University through the Geriatric Workforce Enhancement Program. Thank you for your attention today. And from the bottom of my heart and from families all across the nation, we really wanna thank you for all the work that you do for our loved ones. Thank you very much.